Hello and welcome to the Ohio Health EMS Grand Round Series. My name is Eric Cortez and I serve as the System EMS Medical Director for Ohio Health. We're recording our Ohio Health EMS Grand Round Series for EMS Week 2021. Today I'm joined by Dr. Ann Dietrich to talk about pediatrics. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Dietrich. Very happy to be here. And for our listeners, Dr. Dietrich serves as our medical director for our EMT and paramedic programs at Ohio Health EMS. And she's also our pediatric medical director for Ohio Health EMS as well, and our go to for anything related to pediatrics. And uh, I remember when I was an intern and I first met you at Children's Hospital 11 years ago, and I've been learning from you since then about pediatrics. So we're honored to have you on our Grand Round series. So thank you. Thank you. And we'll just stay with 11 years, right? <laughs> That's right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <Eric. laughs> um, so we have a variety of topics that we wanted to cover in this hour, uh, all things related to pediatrics in the out of hospital setting. So we'll jump right into it. And I'd like to talk about cardiac arrest first. So any any one of our EMS providers gets called on a pediatric cardiac arrest. And of course, you know, uh, that's that's one of the worst case scenarios that you can encounter as any level of provider, especially in the out of hospital setting. So we go on a school aged child that's in cardiac arrest uh, and we arrive on scene. Dr. Dietrich, what kind of things are you thinking about when you approach pediatric cardiac arrest? Um, I think the first thing is you know, school age kid makes me feel a little bit um, optimistic um, because hoping that you're going to identify something we can reverse. So if you get called on a school age child at school, um, it may be a respiratory arrest. Uh, maybe the child's anaphylaxed. Maybe they've choked on something. Um, maybe it's a cardiac event. That's very much statistically less likely in pediatrics than it is in your world, Eric, with adults. Um, but we do see some. So if you have a sudden um, cardiac arrest in a school age child, I would put cardiac on there if you don't have a clear story of something that's happened or transpired right before you get there. Um, but for me, that's an optimistic one um, because I'm hoping it's something you can reverse um, by your interventions um, on immediately on scene. So you brought up different types of etiologies of, of cardiac arrests from the adult world. You know, we tend to focus on reversible causes and the most favorable reversible cause in the out of hospital setting for adults is that VFib, VTAC cardiac arrest. Uh, but it's different in pediatrics. And you mentioned, you know, a most likely cause being respiratory. And also you feel an optimistic about it being in the school age. So uh, as a follow up question, uh, does your prognosis change with somebody that's a newborn versus a toddler versus school age? versus an adolescent, and do the etiologies change at all? Uh, the etiologies uh, change significantly based on the age groups. Um, and I would say in the youngest children, the biggest problem is you may not know. So especially in babies um, under three months of age, we might be dealing with congenital defect that's been missed. Um, for instance, there's metabolic problems um, like hypoglycemia that can actually, I've seen a couple of arrests where the children basically had glucoses of less than three, um, you know what I mean? Very low serum glucoses. Um, that can result in arrest in kids under three. Once you've made it to toddler dumb, usually the metabolic things we know about because you've made it that long and or they've been identified and the family's gonna be able to convey that to you. Um, so you know what you're gonna be treating. Um, toddlers, um, end of infancy to toddler dumb, um, you can see trauma be a problem. Um, you could see a non-accidental trauma um, be a situation where you're called. I've seen a couple of children um, that presented in arrests that were actually um, non-accidental child, um, non-accidental injuries where we had children um, that were very badly assaulted. Um, and sometimes that takes a little time to figure out. You're not going to know that in the field. Um, the biggest thing for pediatrics is that we tend to think of uh, the majority of causes of our arrest being respiratory. Um, and so for us, a huge focus is assessment of that airway and breathing. Um, because as we know, if you've got an, a respiratory arrest and we reverse early in the cardiac arrest, I have the potential to get a normal child back. Um, because if I can reverse that quickly, by the time you've got respiratory arrest that's progressed to cardiac arrest, 
The longer it is, the worse your outcomes, just because of the hypoxic damage to all of the organs. So following up on that, in the adult world, there's some arguments that are made that within the first few minutes of cardiac arrest, we focus on high quality chest compressions and evaluation for a shockable rhythm. Uh, and there's thoughts that in the first few minutes, you can just use passive oxygenation uh, as a way to almost de-emphasize airway management in the first few minutes, that CAB approach uh, that is promoted. Uh, in the pediatric world, would, would you say that, you know, rather than de-emphasizing the airway, that should be uh, promoted as one of the most important things you should do in the first few minutes of the cardiac arrest? It, it, it is, the airway is a primary attention, um, but honestly, we'll take whatever we can get. So if we've got a bystander who will only do chest compressions only, that's better than nothing. Um, I'm gonna try and believe that by moving the chest a little bit, you're gonna get some air exchange um, or I'm hoping for some air exchange. Um, ideally, if we've got skilled providers that are there as quickly as possible, airway um, intervention, getting bag valve mask, getting some kind of chest rise and fall. And honestly, if you can do bag valve mask and get a heart rate back, that's gonna be an incredibly good prognostic um, finding. Um, in the older kids, as you're heading towards childhood, please keep in mind that we can see V-fib, V-tac, especially if they were hit in the chest by a baseball um, or some kind of sudden motion. Um, Eric, correct me on the word, it's cordio modus. Is that, did I say that correctly? Um, I always learned it as commotia cordis. Okay, that's probably but correct. It's, it's probably the same Latin, different forms. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not having learned Latin. Is, is <laughs> Um, but if you've got a situation like that, then obviously take that into your mind and say, this could be cardiac. Um, and going towards and looking to see if there's a shockable rhythm, none of us are going to argue because in pediatrics, although it's rare, if they do have it, it's the same as in adults, you can reverse it. So that is why we do want you to consider it in your list. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. When it comes to when it comes to actually managing the airway, depending on where your pri priorities lay within all the different factors that go into making that decision, um, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's an argument that airway management and pediatric arrests should be focused on bag valve mass ventilation. Uh, and then there's an argument by some that, you know, it's extremely hard to bag valve mask in the out of hospital setting in a moving truck and you get better oxygenation and ventilation with an endotracheal tube. And then there's a group in the middle that uh, promotes utilizing a supraglottic airway, such as an LMA or an IGEL uh, to assist in ventilation and oxygenation. Uh, can you walk us through some of the pros and cons of both uh, of all three approaches? And if you have any advice for our EMS providers uh, when they're trying to choose between those three methods? Um, sure, I, that's an excellent, excellent question, and it's a critical question. Um, so the biggest goal in pediatrics is oxygenation and ventilation, and I really don't care how you get it, you need to get it. So if you've got a child that you start bag valve mask, and you've got nice ch chest rise and fall. Now, the, one of the problems with pediatrics is it is hard to get a seal. And sometimes it's hard, especially if you're all, you may need two people to get a good seal and to get good chest rise and fall, which ties two people up doing that. Um, I am a huge, huge, huge super glottic eye gel fan, um, mainly because I think it um, provides a high degree of um, airway certainty and it allows for very effective oxygenation and ventilation. And um, so that's, I'm kind of in the middle on that. Um, endotracheal intubation is a definitive airway, and in certain situations where you've got a prolonged transport time, say you're on icy roads, um, you just pull the kid from the pond, you've got a 35-minute drive, and you've got no backup for any other way to get out of there, it may be worth trying um, looking and seeing if you can easily intubate the child, because that will give you a definitive airway. Um, on the other hand, if you look and you can't, I would say superglottic is just as good, and some of the studies now are showing that you can get very highly effective oxygenation and ventilation. The biggest problem with endotracheal tube, from my perspective, is it's even hard, and Eric, you'll back me up on this, sometimes in the hospital setting, oh, yeah. get that you're in the right place. And we all know that 45 seconds to one minute of complete, am I sure I'm in there? Even when you see it go in, 
you know, in pediatrics, they can slip out, your hand can slip, and it's just a small movement. You've got to be absolutely 100% positive with endotracheal intubation that you're in the right spot. And the reason that the pediatrics has gone towards um, superglottic and towards bag valve mask is if you're in the wrong spot, you got four, four to six minutes and it's over for the kid. And so that's why we're such strong advocates for um, those alternative airways or bag valve mask where we can assure that oxygenation and ventilation. Thank you. That's really helpful. And just acknowledging that there's certain circumstances where one is going to work better than the other. And, you know, it's one of those things where there's not just one answer. And I, th I think our EMS providers appreciate that because they work in such a di dynamic environment. Uh, and I super Please go ahead. And I, and I appreciate their critical decision making. So if you and your partner hold a discussion and you say, you know, this is how long we have air shut down. We've got to make a 35 minute trip. There's only two of us. We do not have a rhythm. Let's look and see if we can intubate. I appreciate that thought process. Um, and honestly, if you can get the tube in, that's going to free one person up to easily hold and, and use that critical decision making about what you think is in your patient's best interest. And the majority of times, you're going to be the best at making that decision. In regards to endotracheal tubes, if if we get to that, both in the setting of an arrest or in a non-arrest uh, uh, patient encounter where, where we have to intubate, it seems like the paradigm is shifting between uncuffed and cuffed endotracheal tubes for pediatrics. Do you have any recommendations on, on the type of tube that we use? All of them cuffed. Um, it, it used to be, and, and you, you, anybody who's practiced for more than five to 10 years all knows that something that we were taught, and I probably yelled at Eric when he was an intern, and said, Eric, you should never, ever, ever <laughs> use a cuff tube in a child because it's going to damage that poor trachea, and how could you even think of that? And then they got better cuffs, and they got cuffs that didn't cause damage, and the ICU... I love my ICU colleagues. I, I really do. They are wonderful because they make patients leave the emergency department, right? They go upstairs. But they all were like, okay, what do we do if the kid gets upstairs and someone decided to put a 302 tube in a four-year-old? How much of a leak do you have? You have a huge leak. Now that pulmonary disease is progressing and they're trying to oxygenate and ventilate upstairs. And their only option at that point in time is to change the endotracheal tube. Mm -hmm. An uncuffed tube, they, they have no choice. They have to pull it out and redo it. And that's a really dangerous position for that child to be in. The beauty of the cuff tube is if you put it in and the child is doing great, you may never need to use the cuff. But if the child gets sicker, the ICU can blow up the cuff, cut off the leak without putting the child at risk. And they can increase their ventilator settings and go to more sophisticated um, equipment if they need to, you know, high frequency or ECMO. And, and you've and they are able to not have to intervene in a situation they don't want to go back and intervene. That makes a lot of sense. Um, when, it, when it comes to utilizing guidelines, of, of course, we have our, our pediatric guidelines, and then some of our EMS agencies utilize the neonatal resuscitation guidelines as well. And there's some subtle differences and maybe not so subtle differences between each of those algorithms for cardiac arrest. When, when do you apply uh, ne the neonatal guidelines versus the pediatric guidelines. When when's your cutoff for that in in the out of hospital setting? Oh, Eric, I don't even know the answer to that. Um, I know that there's an overlap, and honestly, I've always I've used neonatal under thirty days, and I've used peds after thirty days. But I would say I'd have to actually do some research to give you a, a completely um, correct answer on that one. Um, well, it, it seems to be an, an area of uncertainty. And, yeah. um, you know, it seems like the neonatal guidelines emphasize that, you know, a lower, um, you know, compression to ventilation ratio, which makes sense because you're working on the respiratory side of things. But it seems to come up because in, in the hospital setting, you know, if somebody delivers, then we typically will do neonatal versus if they come in from home, then 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 we typically do the pediatric guidelines. But um, uh, that that seems to come up. And 
I think it gets back to what you were saying is, you know, the specifics matter less than prioritizing and assuring good compressions and oxygenation and ventilation is probably the and most I'm important thing. You, in under 30 days, we still use uncuffed tubes. So that's the one thing that I would mention for the cuffed versus uncuffed is under 30 days, we still like the uncuffed tube. And that's because the airway is so small. We don't want to waste outside circumference. Mm. Uh, on having um, a cuff there. So under 30 days, it's still recommended that you use the uncuffed. Um, I think under, you know, under three months of age, it's respiratory, just the vast, 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 vast majority of time. And so focusing on the airway and oxygenating is gonna be critical. And I know the, um, you know, the NRP guidelines are really, really good at the time of delivery. And they also do a pretty nice job with talking about some of the different congenital things that you can confront that you usually don't have to confront after 10 to 14 days of age. But we occasionally see some of those um, congenital things show up up to 30 days of age. So that's probably the overlap is up to 30 days, I would guess. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um... Before we transition into our next clinical topic, anything else that you'd like our listeners to take home about pediatric cardiac arrest? Think of hypoglycemia. Think of anything you can fix. So if you've got a child in arrest, I usually would not say, you know, oh, check a glucose. But if they're under 30 days of age, uh, hypoglycemia will kill you as fast as hypoxia. So if you've got a child that's um, critically ill under 30 days, also think about that glucose. Um, we've had a couple of full arrest kids that were metabolic children um, that ended up having very low glucoses. So just add that into your list of things because it um, doesn't hurt to get a big dose of glucose if you've got something that's really low. Thank you for that. That's a great point. Oh, and the other thing is, Eric, they've, they've switched. I probably most of your providers are there with the compressions, um, hands around in the thumbs. I don't know who ever liked the two finger technique. I, I, I for me, it was like slip sliding away. You know what I mean? Like you're trying to get your finger. So, um, but they have officially come out and recommended that you do the hands and circling with the thumbs. All right. That's good to know. So it's a busy day and let's say our providers that, that we're working with, they get called on another pediatric run. Um, so this time it's for a child that is having a seizure. Um, parents are on scene and uh, the child's never had a seizure before. And uh, they called approximately six minutes ago and our, and our providers arrive on scene and the child is still seizing, you know, six minutes later upon our arrival. So. Um, I, I'd like to talk to you about pediatric seizures. There's a lot of questions that come up about optimal medications and an approach to pediatric seizures. Um, what's, what's going through your mind when you encounter somebody that's been seizing for six minutes? Um, it's time to do something. Um, one of the things that um, has come out over the last few years and I, I'm guessing it's adults too, as well as kids. It used to be that people felt you could go with a little longer seizure activity. And so there used to be those little time delays where you'd see if the child would stop seizing on their own. Um, and there's some pretty good literature now that shows that what happens is that when they seize, they get more acidotic, which makes them seize more, which makes them more acidotic, which makes them seize more. So um, the neurologists are jealous of the cardiologists who have their STEMI alerts. And so they want status epilepticus alerts because the, the, well, the push is, is that the faster we stop them, the faster we stop them and the better their outcomes. So um, I, the latest guidelines I saw were, Eric, you can go five minutes. If they seize longer than five minutes, then it's time to go ahead and do something. Now, I'm going to caution you in the littler kids, if they are under Absolutely. If they're under six months, think about it. If they're under a year and have any kind of medical problems, be cautious to not forget about metabolic problems because hypoglycemia can make you seize. And we don't want, because like I said earlier, it's fixable. And anything you do, as long as you're still hypoglycemic, won't stop the seizure. So getting them glucose is the only treatment for hypoglycemia. Um, the other things that can cause seizures, especially in kids under three months, four months, six months of age, are families diluting formula with lots of water. 
So say they don't have enough money to make the full strength formula, they dilute it with water so it lasts longer. The problem with diluting is it makes the hypo, it makes it hyponatremic. So those kids can have low sodiums that will make them seize. So if you have a family that has a history of giving a child four bottles of water today and no formula, or diluting the formula a lot and giving water, we worry about hyponatremia as a cause of seizures, and that we have to fix by giving them sodium. Um, other than that, most of the time, our seizures are gonna be idiopathic, um, and so we're gonna just go forward with treatment. And I'd say, I'd say almost every national expert agrees now that midazolam internasally is the best way to start that treatment. Um, fast, effective. Um, I have to admit, I wanted more data when it first came out. And Dr. Kessick was much more of an earlier onboarder than I was. Um, but in pediatrics, we like we like more data. We just <laughs> safe when we're dealing with kids. So, but it turns out he was 100% correct. Um, and using internasal midazolam is a quick first line agent. The benzos have been shown to be very effective. Yeah, with the benzodiazepines, I think if our EMS providers want to look at the Rampart study, I think that's a nice study to look at and different routes. And basically when it comes down to it is the paper did a nice job of incorporating all the operational challenges that you face on scene, getting access and getting medications drawn up. And uh, when it came down to it, it, you know, you were able to get the med on quicker and the seizure stopped uh, in a decent way with I am. Um, uh, or intranasal midazolam uh, as a nice alternative route. Um, Dr. Dietrich, if let's say we, we arrive on scene with just, uh, you know, two providers and it's a pediatric seizure, is it more important to get a benzo on board first or to check a blood sugar? I would say statistically, if the child's over six months of age, getting a benzo on board is going to be more important. Like if you have a chubby six month old that looks absolutely like they've had no issues with growth and you know what I mean, size, then it's most likely you're gonna need the intranasal midazolam. If you get there and the kids, they say it's six months and it looks like it's two months and the kid's really scrawny, doesn't have a lot of subcutaneous fat, or you've got mom says there's been issues going on, some other chronic medical problems, then I'd check a glucose um, as quickly as I could. Um, but for the healthy, normal appearing kids, I think the, it's, it's a safe drug, you know what I mean? And, and even if you get a glucose afterwards and you've given it, you haven't done any harm. You'll just still need to fix the glucose if it's low. For some of our inner facility transport, uh, folks, um, can you talk about some of the second line treatments for seizure, like phosphenitoin or some of the other second line drugs that are possibly used? Um, you, you know, it's it's become quite interesting because um, in pediatrics, under a month of age, it was always recommended that phenobarb was your, I'm going to say, then, well, actually, in under a month of age for a long time, phenobarb was first line. Um, benzos were second. And the reason that the benzos were second was because of respiratory depression and ending up having to deal with airway issues in addition to everything else. Um, right now, you'll find people go back and forth. Um, since most of you don't have phenobarb, benzos are going to be what you're going to use. But if you use benzos in a baby under two months of age, you need to have bag valve mask ready to go. You just need to plan on, I'm going to have airway issues and I'm going to need to correct them. So um, having, it, having said that, the older kids, it's the same as the adult literature. We've got three drugs that are in run for each other, uh, phosphenitoin, um, I can never say the levisiri, how do we, levy? I always approach it as levetiracetam, but that's probably wrong too. <laughs> Actually, that sounds like the phonics approach, so that would be what I would like, so yes. <laughs> okay. so that one, and, and that one's showing great, 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 great promise. And having less side effects and less potential toxicity with IV administration. So that one has really made some jump starts. Um, the problem with phenobarb is, is respiratory depression. So in pediatrics, you know, if you, I used to just say, you might as well set up the endotracheal tube. If you use benzos with phenobarb, I, you are, you are going for airway. You know what I mean? Like, and, and just be ready and set. And, you know, the minute the phenobarb started working, 
the respiratory depression, um, especially combined with the benzo, was definitely going to be there. Sometimes our, our providers will talk about febrile seizures in pediatrics. How does that play into uh, our mindset where we're in the out-of-hospital setting? Should, should we try to differentiate a seizure versus febrile seizure? Uh, and, you know, what, what are the chances of our providers actually encountering somebody with a simple febrile seizure? It's actually pretty high. The good news is it's sort of like you, you all enjoy those croup calls at what, 2 a.m. in the morning where the parents call you and they're absolutely hysterical. The kid can't catch their breath. They can't catch their breath. They grab the child. They run outside and wait for you. And by the time you get there, the kids breathed in the cold night air and they look like a million bucks. In fact, they look better than you do. Um, the same is kind of true for febrile seizures. So usually what will happen with the febrile seizures, the child will have um, a high fever, they'll have a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Um, the interesting thing is that they shorten the definition of status epilepticus to five minutes, and the definition for febrile seizure is under 15 minutes. So you've got this kind of overlap. Um, the good news is most of the time, by the time you get there, because the parents will take a few minutes to react, they'll take a few minutes to get their head together to call 911, they'll take a few minutes for you to get there, Usually you're hitting the end of the seizure by the time you get there. And what you'll get there too is a febrile child that's in the post-ictal phase where they're just kind of washed out. Um, sometimes they're just kind of um, lethargic, um, maybe starting to cry a little weakly. Um, and you're more in the phase of, you know, giving them supplemental oxygen, making sure their glucose is okay. And by the way, you know, that glucose check is a great stimulant. Um, because usually they'll let out a nice loud scream and that's good in pediatrics. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's fine. Um, and so, but by definition, if they have a uh, seizure that's generalized um, less than 15 minutes associated with a temperature and it resolves. And usually as you're coming in, you'll notice as you're getting to the hospital, the kids now starting to look around, parents are shaking like there's no tomorrow, especially if their kids never had one like this before. Um, and the kids looking better and better. We don't do anything in the emergency department. Febrile seizures are benign. In fact, the treatments have higher risk with them than the actual disease does. So most of the time it's looking for what's causing the fever. Do they have a viral illness? Um, do they have an ear infection? Do they have, um, and most of the time it's gonna be a virus. But usually what you do is you just let them wake up. And as you know, um, Eric, we just you know treat their, um, any infections they have or don't treat anything and watch them, make sure they're okay and send them home with careful instructions for the parents. Um, but you will, I would say a lot of EMS calls, especially the first time a kid has one, you know, the parents are just terrified. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's, that's really helpful. And I think addresses a lot of the, a lot of the challenging aspects of encountering seizures in the, in the out of hospital environment. Um, Let's transition to another, I think, challenging encounter. Let's say there's a uh, preschooler that, uh, you, you know, you arrive to the preschool uh, for somebody with uh, hives and tongue swelling and strider and some respiratory distress. Uh, so uh, this child actually has a history of a peanut allergy and inadvertently ate a cookie at preschool that had a, a peanut in it. So uh, we're concerned about anaphylaxis. Um, what are some important uh, aspects of anaphylactic management for our EMS providers? Hopefully, they've already given the first dose of Um I, I hope that they've recognized, especially with that clear of a history, what they're dealing with. Um, I think another important aspect of it is that you've got, if you've got a child that's just eaten a peanut, if you see peanut on the fingertips or you see peanut in the mouth, wash away any exposures that you possibly can. Mm -hmm because the child's gonna to continue to absorb those. Um, after you've done that, get the IM epi into them. Um, as you know, Eric, that's statistically been shown to be the biggest and the main thing that we can do to decrease morbidity and mortality is gonna be IM epi. Um, they've actually shown the lateral thighs the best place to give it, IM, no sub -Qs, um, to get the best delivery of the medication. And again, the sooner it's given, the better likely you are to break the spell. The longer there's delays with administration of that first dose, the more the cycle gets going and the worse the kids um, can become sick. If they're striderous, you can easily give them a racemic epi. Um, it's gonna be more symptomatic relief, but sometimes that will help while your IM epi is taking effect. 
Um, if they're wheezing, you can go ahead and give them um, albuterol. I go back and forth about the H1 and H2. You know, the studies are not that um, convincing of how much of a difference they make, but they don't seem to hurt. So I will routinely use those. Um, steroids, the literature is very confusing, but I, I still always use those. Um, and that's more for, you know, two to four hours. It's not going to be for within that first five to 10 minutes. Um, and you can repeat the IM epi if you're still having problems. But if you're still having problems, think about, does this child have an ongoing exposure? Um, we've had a couple of kids that have, you know, had people put lotions all over them um, that had peanut in them. And until you get that peanut off of them, the kid's going to continue to absorb it. So if you've given that first IM epi and your kid's not improving, look and say, is there any place this child can still be getting exposed? Um, and then kind of progress up the ladder um, with your treatment. I think that's a really good point about eliminating the exposure. I just taught a little bit about that this morning, actually, and I failed to mention that. Uh, so that's a really good point that we don't always think about, especially being in, in the hospital. Uh, but out out in the field, out in the homes, or in a preschool, that, that may not have occurred. So that's, I, I think, really important. Um, My oldest... My oldest son has, um, he anaphylaxis to tree nuts and um, shellfish. And actually, sometimes um, teachers don't listen to you very well. So my questions to him were if he got the metallic taste in his mouth after he ate something and he felt like he was starting to have problems, make sure he was near someone else, go wash his mouth out, scrub it out. Um, he usually threw up, which honestly was probably the best protection his body could do for him. But then I told him, wash your mouth out after that. Wash your lips, scrub your hands with soap and water, and then um, grab your epi. And if you need it, give it. Um, but I, I do think that sometimes we don't realize that the kids are still getting exposed to it. And um, that can help just shorten the, um, the uh, period of absorption. Yeah. <laughs> I know that we a lot of times forget about the GI aspect or, you, you know, that can be one of the systems involved with anaphylaxis. So nausea and vomiting or even diarrhea after um, after an exposure to the allergen can, can be one of the systems involved. And the GI system has a big role in the immune system too. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think the other thing is sometimes people, like you guys will transport kids down to children's after they've been someplace for an anaphylactic reaction. Understand that that pediatric we take it very seriously. It's so even if you did everything right and the kid got better, they're still looking at some people say six, some people say twelve, some people say eighteen to twenty four hours of observation. Um, especially if they ate something because it goes into the stomach. So you've got you know you could get them better, but then what happens? If they get a second release from the material that's still in their stomach, sometimes we'll see the kids get sick again. And so a lot of people keep them there, obs them, make sure that that we're through the whole episode, then train them on their EpiPens, make sure they have the equipment at home if they need that. Um, but don't ever feel bad if someone says, oh, and you're like, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. Um, it's just we worry about the kids and the fact that they could have a second spell with um, a release of that into their body again. And we want them in a safe place if, if they would require that. That's excellent. If, if our providers arrive on scene, I'm just trying to get your, your thought process here. Let's say there's an unused junior EpiPen or we have to draw up our own epinephrine and give it. Um, is it okay just to give a first dose of a junior EpiPen and then draw up a second dose and give that if needed? I don't see any reason why not. Um, I think it depends on what you have the quickest access to. And I always, you know, we'll, we had somebody one time, um, one of my partners dealt with a child that was having um, hives and lip swelling, but didn't remember eating anything he was allergic to. They grabbed the EpiPen and carried it with him while they drove him to the urgent care. Okay. And, and, and you know, at the same time, and it's like they came out and they're like, you know, somebody's trying to drop Epi and at the same time, they've got the EpiPen right there. And they use the EpiPen, they were like, you know, this is faster. Um, make sure that the one thing, if I'm truly dealing with anaphylaxis, and when we talk about anaphylaxis, there's a lot of people who call anaphylaxis things 
that's not. So remember, it has to be involving two body systems. So you need to have someone with lip swelling, angioedema, hives, and respiratory problems or circulatory problems. So if they drink milk and get diarrhea, that is not anaphylaxis. If they um, get stung by a bee and have an itchy spot over the bee sting, and I know you guys don't, but parents can have some very different perceptions. Um, and if mom has a bee allergy, sometimes she'll say, well, it's itching. And, but that's not anaphylaxis for us, um, unless the child develops you know, hives in that area and um, wheezing, respiratory distress, um, or sometimes you can see blood pressure problems. That makes sense, thank you. I'd like to shift gears again and talk a little bit about pediatric trauma. And um, um, in the adult world, you, you know, we have some good literature about how we should manage pre-hospital patients uh, that are likely having a traumatic brain injury. Uh, let's say that we run on somebody that has a significant mechanism. Let's say they have, you know, a GCS of uh, 10 or 11 and uh, signs of head trauma. What are some things that we should be doing before we get to the hospital to you know, keep the patient safe and avoid any secondary or iatrogenic injuries to the patient? Um, th that's a very good case because 10 to 11, as, as Eric knows, and all of you probably do too, you can make a difference. So we can't do anything about the primary head injury, which occurred at the minute of impact or the minute of impact and rolling and further impact. Um, but we can do things the secondary injuries and the secondary injuries are going to be hypoxia and hypotension. So poor blood flow and poor oxygen delivery. Um, so making sure that you've got um, a good, airway. you know, cervical spine immobilization, um, spinal motion restriction has kind of um, changed a little bit, but I would still argue, I would like you to use spinal motion restriction in a child with a head injury who's got a GCS less than 15. Um, if they can't tell you their neck doesn't hurt, then you have to assume they have a cervical spine or a potential for a cervical spine injury. Pediatrics, very blessed, low incidence, very unusual. So, um, but you still need to protect in case it's the one child who does, because that would be devastating also. Um, and then um, making sure you give oxygen. People talk about 100% oxygen versus, you know, bringing it down. Um, my theory is hypoxia is the is a killer in pediatrics. So if you over oxygenate them for 20 minutes at the beginning of their injury, I've never seen any literature you're doing any harm. So I would rather have you over oxygenate than under oxygenate in a child that's got a brain injury, um, especially since we don't know what internal pathology is going on, but we do know the cells are damaged and they're going to need extra oxygen. So you know, don't worry about that in that first. I'd say half an hour, and I'd say in the emergency department, most people don't think about that. You know what I mean? We'll start and wean when we're, we're perfectly able to. Um, intubation wise, um, this child clearly with them being, you know, at 11, you're probably going to need to support their airway in some way. Um, I would leave it to your critical decision making. Um, if they still have a gag, clearly you're not gonna be able to use an eye gel or an oral airway. <laughs> and because vomiting, really sucks and not only for you but for the patient so <laughs> do that um but at the same time sometimes you can assist their ventilations and work with them and provide them uh, with a uh, good oxygen delivery um getting iv started um if they've got multiple systems injury then looking at their circulatory set status you know are they tachycardic do they have poor perfusion do you look down and see this huge bruise across their abdomen which tells you, you know, you probably got a secondary injury. And then if they're tachycardic, poor perfusion, you're going to go ahead and give them a fluid bolus. Um, normal saline versus 3%, you know, when you're looking at it, um, I think that's not going to be in the first half hour, but that is going to be something that you would consider if you've got elevated ICP as you're going down your pathway. Yeah, more for the in a facility role, but still, a, still an important decision. With uh, suspected pediatric TBI, you know, you, you mentioned avoiding hypoxia and avoiding hypotension. If we extrapolate from the adult world, you know, even a little bit of time being hypoxic or hypotensive affects outcome. Um, what about the respiratory rate? How should we be bagging? How fast should we be bagging pediatric TBI? Should we be hyperventilating, normal ventilation, hypoventilation? 
Uh, normal ventilation. If you can get there, PCO2s around the 34, 33, 34, 35, and I'm not that exact. So you're 30, I'm not going to argue. Um, but you don't want to hyperventilate them. Um, there's been some good studies that have shown, um, especially in some of our younger kids, believe it or not, that um, you do get some good vasoconstriction with hyperventilation and poor delivery of oxygen to those poor injured cells. So you want to keep them, ventilate them at a normal rate. Um, and so you're going to have to check yourself and your partner because the biggest problem is your adrenaline is probably six times the level of the adrenaline within the child, um, which is probably pretty high. And so you're going to have to make yourself slow down and bag them at a normal rate for age um, so that you don't unintentionally hyperventilate, which honestly, that's why respiratory therapists are just from heaven because they don't even think about it. everybody else. You know what I mean? You're, you get going and you're not thinking and they, they time it. They just do it. So you're going to have to make yourself slow down and bag them at a normal rate. Another topic in the adult world is the concept of permissive hypotension. So somebody without a TBI that we don't need to do our best to avoid hypotension on, maybe just unstable, uh, you, you know, hemorrhagic shock where, where we accept the lower blood pressure uh, in the adult world. Does that translate to the pediatric world, that, that, that concept of permissive hypotension? It, that's a very difficult concept. And the reason it's a very difficult concept is even a major children's hospital like children's only takes probably five kids to the OR per year. So having hypotension in pediatrics is incredibly unusual. So usually our kids are going to have normal blood pressures and be tachycardic um, with poor perfusion. And so, but being judicious in what you give them. So we want to give them, if they need a fluid bolus, then go ahead and give them 20 per kilo, then stop, recheck heart rate, look at your blood pressure, look at your child. You don't want to give extra fluids if you don't need to, um, but at the same time, you don't want to um, not give them some extra fluids. Most of the kids, even with liver lax and spleen lax, you remember the liver and spleen squish, they don't explode. So our kids have thicker capsules. So when they squish, they'll bleed into them, but the bleeding usually stops as long as they can coagulate. And so we don't wanna dilute the, coagul um, the coagulation factors unless we need to. But if they're tachycard perfusion, you give them one fluid bolus, reassess, and then as soon as you can, you're gonna cut back on your fluids. Um, for inner facility transports, we'll frequently see people get CT scans that look awful. I remember I got called by somebody and he's like, I'm calling the helicopter. This kid's got a grade four, four or five, you know, four splenic rupture. And I was like, well, that sounds terrible. How's the kid? He wants to, he wants to eat dinner. <laughs> he wants to what? She said, well, he's a teenage boy and he says he's really hungry and he's really mad. And I said, what's his heart rate? His heart rate was 72. What's his blood pressure? 120 over 80. I wouldn't give him fluids. I wouldn't give him anything. His body is working just fine by itself. And it was this big discussion we had because we could only think of ways we'd, dis we'd further cause him to bleed if we gave him more fluids. And mm -hmm. he was admitted. He never needed surgery. He never got anything. He went home after two days, still mad at us because we wouldn't feed him, but that's <laughs> He was a teenager. There you go. Well, that's what his mom said. His mom says, well, he usually eats every two hours. <laughs> Today, he's not going to eat every two hours. Uh, that's a great story. And just, a, you know, it just demonstrates how, you know, pediatrics, even if it's a teenager, it's just, just a different approach than adults. Um, so now definitely other, appreciate that. Now, the other thing, Eric, I wanted to mention, we talked about, we talked about trauma. If you get a child under a year of age that has a new onset seizure, I hate to even bring this up because it's such an awful topic, but you need to also think about non-accidental or abusive head trauma. So if you've got a child that you get there and this kid's not had any medical problems, was fine, was in the bottom, you know, was playing in their playpen, um, they came in and the child's now seizing uncontrollably, you get there, the child's seizing, stop for three seconds, don't waste a lot of time, um, but think to yourself, you know, is that Fontenelle full? 
Do I see any bruises on that child? Do I see any ear bruises? Do I see any neck bruises? Those high risk areas that are frequently associated with non accidental trauma. Um, every year, there's a number of children that pre present with status epilepticus that are um, actually abusive head trauma kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to think about that and move the kid from the medical category to the trauma category. If you see indications and your mind says to you, this is on my list, you're not going to hurt the child to use spinal restriction. You're not going to hurt the child. You know what I mean? To protect them and treat them as a spinal, um, as a potential trauma patient until there's further imaging and further testing done. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. I'd like to close out just with uh, one more case to get your thoughts on it and uh, any advice for dealing with this difficult concept for our pre-hospital providers. You know, we, we get called on, let's say, a, um, a newborn uh, at home that is, I don't know, let's just say, you know, 30 days old. And uh, parents called because uh, the child went limp for a while, turned blue, and appeared to stop breathing, you know, and it was a decent amount of time where that, that happened and they called 911. But when we get there, uh, our EMS providers, you know, are, are looking at a very well appearing baby. Um, what do you think about that case? And is there anything that our providers should be concerned about? First of all, you should be going hallelujah. Um, there's nothing better than seeing a beautiful baby. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> ever, ever, ever. <laughs> Um, because probably your entire ride over, your sphincter tightened, your blood pressure went up. And so seeing a beautiful baby is a wonderful thing, but we can't ignore the history. And if you've got a child that has a blue spell, um, there is something new that's called a brewery, which is a brief resolved unexplained event. Which is a low risk category of that old apparent life threatening event. There are now ways that we can differentiate in the emergency department between high risk and low risk children. It doesn't apply to, to the pre hospital setting. You get that kind of story. You just thank your lucky stars. You're having a good day at work and the baby looks good. Um, you would want to think about a, a low blood sugar. So that might be something that you check on. Um, you would want to think about um, non accidental trauma. The biggest fear we have with the breweries is that that's um, the high risk breweries are actually the kids we do more of a workup on. And the reason we do more of a work on is their um, risk factors for um, possible non accidental trauma and other types of diseases is increased. So, but you do not want to leave a baby under 30 days. Um, you know, my, when I do pediatric EMS protocols, I just tell them if they're under 30 days and mom says the fart smells funny. Just take them in and let everybody else figure it out um, because that age group, the parents don't know the baby yet. They're just getting to know the baby and it's so hard to differentiate who's got something serious that's starting. And just the same way I, if, you know, if you say to me, my instincts say there's something wrong here under 30 days, if mom says there's something not right, I'm willing to go with her instincts. So mm -hmm. I will take that very seriously. Blue spells should always be taken seriously in babies under 30 days of age. Um, it could be the beginning of sepsis. It could be a seizure. It could be, um, I think there's 27 things on the list. Um, now, in the emergency department, Dr. Cortez, with his excellent team, may work through that differential by history and physical, and decide the child doesn't need a workup. That doesn't mean you're wrong for bringing them in. That means that they got more evaluation, and actually the biggest thing they got was four hours in Dr. Cortez's department so that he could be sure that nothing was going on. Uh, because if the child develops respiratory distress, if the child gets more symptoms, he's gonna clearly escalate the workup. And so that's the point with those is trying to get them someplace so that if they're getting sicker, that can be. Um, but the low risk breweries, they actually found a certain subcategory that you don't need to do much testing. But in the field, I, I don't think that's possible to differentiate those things. That was a great summary. And the one point stuck out to me, especially important is in kids, sometimes you just need more time to see if they're sick or not. And uh, being at a non-pediatric ED, um, we use that a lot is we'll just sit on them. You know, we'll, we'll just let them sit there and see if they declare themselves sick or, or 
not sick and our pre-hospital providers don't have that luxury to sit on scene for four hours or six hours whether it's anaphylactis or brewies or uh just not being able to keep PO fluid down so that was a great point is it, you know just because you transport and end up being discharged that was a that was an indicated transport and uh that was good for the patient so and always trust your instincts so if you're there you, you, as you do more and more runs there's there's red flags you see and you feel that sometimes they're hard to articulate. Um, but nobody's gonna ever argue if you bring them in. And a lot of times you're right. And so I'd rather protect a child or I'd rather keep a child for a couple hours and make sure everything's okay. Then I'd rather have you get a second call with things being in a much worse situation. Well, Dr. Dietrich, I wanna thank you for uh, spending the afternoon with us and, and uh, participating in this EMS Grand Rounds on pediatrics. Uh, before I close it out, I wanna give you one last opportunity to just uh, provide any summary or any uh, closing comments about EMS pediatrics. Um, I wanna say thank you to all of you out there for everything you do. Um, it is incredibly invaluable and it is appreciated, although sometimes People don't acknowledge it. It's there. We do appreciate exactly what you do. We appreciate you taking time to really being careful with families and being careful with the children. And so thank you. Yeah, and thank you. And I would like to echo that as well. We, we appreciate all of our EMS providers and uh, for all that you do for our patients in the out of hospital environment. Um, I, I wanna thank you, Ann, for uh, again, just taking part in this. This was really, really, really good. And hopefully we can do more of these in the future, but you were able to hit on a lot of, of, of high risk and, and very important topics in pediatrics. So uh, we thank you for that uh, very much. Um, for our listeners, please make sure you go to ohiohealthems.com where you can get information about CE credit. Also check out our other offerings on ohiohealthems.com. We have several options for virtual learning. We have other grand round recordings and we have access to our podcast as well as other online content as well. If you have any questions about today or anything in general about Ohio Health EMS, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm at eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com. Uh, and again, anything, uh, feel free to reach out and we thank you for your time. Have a nice day.